So now we are finally ready to look into more details to the statistical properties of the Odin least squares estimator. And uh, we'll start by from the finite sample properties. So uh, recall I, I classified the statistical properties to finite sample properties that uh, apply at the, irrespective of the sample size. And particularly, I will consider unbiasedness, but also efficiency and uh, mean squared error or MSE. So these are also relevant uh, concepts to know. So let's start from the unbiasedness. So here's the definition in general. Uh, so uh, we say that the OLS estimator is unbiased if the expected value of the, of the estimator is equal to its uh, uh, true value. So like in the previous lessons, I will focus on the single regression case and I will focus mainly on the slope coefficient uh, uh, B2, which is estimator of this uh, true slope coefficient beta 2. And uh, the unbiasedness is an uh, important property to ensure that uh, the estimator doesn't systematically underestimate or overestimate the, the true parameter value that we are interested in. So let me briefly illustrate uh, what does this unbiasedness mean. So recall that, uh, that this uh, OLS estimator itself is a random variable. This is because we, we estimated based on our random random data of, uh, of y, and perhaps x might be also random. So on this diagram, I have plotted then uh, two density functions. So these density functions would, uh, would refer to um, some two alternative estimators. And uh, there is this black color density function, which illustrates uh, the density function of an estimator that is unbiased. So, so uh, notice that uh, that for this black density function, the expected value is equal to this uh, parameter beta, which uh, which was uh, according to the definition of unbiasedness also important. So the expected value of this estimator is equal to the beta. It can overestimate or it can underestimate the, the beta, but uh, on the average, if you repeat this estimation many, many, many times, potentially infinitely many times, then on the average you would get uh, get uh, get beta. Then there is another density function with this kind of uh, light blue color, and this is illustrating how a how a density function of a biased estimator like, might look like. So notice that uh, there is also of course variation in this uh, in this um, according to the estimator that this density function is with this light blue color but there is systematic uh, downward bias in that estimate. So, so uh, typically then you would get uh, always some, your estimates would be lower than this true beta. So this is what the bias means, that there is some kind of systematic uh, um, deviation to the left or to the right from this, so from this true beta. And uh, uh, this example illustrates that uh, why it is desirable to have an unbiased estimator that you do not systematically overestimate or underestimate. So how can we approach then the bias or unbiasedness of the OLS estimator? So now I want to recall this result that we actually proved in the previous lesson already, that, uh, that we can re always rewrite this um, uh, formula of our OLS estimator for B2 uh, as this uh, to be equal to the true beta 2 plus some kind of error component. And this error component consists of the sample covariance of x and epsilon divided by a sample variance of x. So this is the result we already have discussed in detail, so now we take it as a, as a given. And we can utilize this result to then to examine unbiasedness of the OLS estimator. So now I combine these two results. So, so firstly I start from the definition that, uh, that says that OLS estimator is unbiased if the expected value of the coefficient is equal to equal to this uh, corresponding beta. And when I apply this expected value operator to this uh, to this uh, formula that we had on the previous slide, so recall that this uh, const beta two is just a constant. So the expected value of beta two is just beta two. So then we can only we only need to apply the expected value operator to this uh, uh, error term. 
that we had in the previous slide. And uh, therefore, th if you compare this definition of OLS estimator and this, and this result of the expected value, then we can prove that actually OLS is unbiased whenever this expected value of this error component is equal to zero. So in other words, this would require that the, the sample covariance of uh, expected value of the sample covariance between X and Epsilon is equal to zero. And we need to have that there's some variance in this uh, variable X. And now if we, if we then finally utilize this result that the sample covariance uh, is an unbiased estimator of the, of the population covariance and similarly sample variance is also unbiased estimator of the population variance, then we can replace this expected value of the sample statistics by the population statistics. Okay, so this requires that, uh, that for example, that sample covariance is an unbiased estimator of the population covariance. If that applies, then we can actually examine what is the population covariance between X and Epsilon. So essentially, uh, our OLS estimator is unbiased if our explanatory variable X doesn't correlate with the, with the error term epsilon. So this requires then some kind of assumption about the, about the error term. And uh, if you recall then, if you recall this uh, uh, Wooldrick's textbook assumptions, then there is this assumption about the zero conditional mean. And I want to, at this point, a little bit clarify still this assumption that uh, the zero conditional mean is not exactly the same as unconditional mean. So uh, notice that, uh, that uh, uh, if, if the zero conditional mean assumption applies, then also the unconditional mean of the epsilon. So this is on this uh, second line, this, uh, that the expected value of epsilon is equal to zero. So that the expected value of epsilon is the unconditional mean. And if the conditional mean is zero for any value of X, then it also implies that unconditional mean is equal to zero. But this is not the only thing that you, I noticed that sometimes in, uh, in introductory text, uh, uh, some people assume that the unconditional expectation of epsilon is equal to zero, but that's not enough to uh, ensure unbiasedness. We, we also need that this uh, covariance of X and epsilon is equal to zero. And this is actually also a consequence of the zero conditional mean assumption. So for this course, purposes of this course, I will just uh, make the statement that the zero conditional mean implies both that the expected value of epsilon is equal to zero and that covariance of X and epsilon is equal to zero. But uh, I do not want to spend more time to proving it. So if you're interested in that, why, why that is the case, I have here a link to some some lecture notes of uh, of M. G. Abbott, where this is also explained in details. In fact, the proof is not very very complicated, but uh, but uh, I think it slightly goes beyond the scope of this course. And I also want to point out that in some some econometrics textbooks, actually these assumptions are stated separately. So some books state uh, separately that unconditional expectation of epsilon is equal to zero and that they also explicitly state that covariance of X and Epsilon is equal to zero. So it would be completely fine to break it down to two, two assumptions. So, so if, you, if you do not feel comfortable with the zero conditional mean assumption, you can always just, uh, just make this assumption that, uh, that the expected value of Epsilon is equal to zero and that covariance of X and Epsilon is equal to zero. If you write these two assumptions in the exam, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. It's always kind of, uh, um, to some extent, um, a matter of choice or matter of taste that, uh, that which way these assumptions are stated, both ways are equally fine. And uh, it's maybe, maybe for, for, for some purposes, uh, Woodridge prefers to state it as a zero conditional mean. In some sense, you can then, then eliminate one of the assumptions. However, I believe that it's, it's in some sense more intuitive perhaps to state it separately that unconditional mean of epsilon is equal to zero and that covariance of X and Epsilon is equal to zero. So in any case, now I have, I have discussed already about this, uh, this assumption. So the zero conditional mean assumption of the Woolrich, it's actually equivalent to assuming that, uh, that unconditional mean of Epsilon is zero, but also that covariance of X and Epsilon is equal to zero. 
So now if we utilize this assumption, then notice that when we, when we go back to this uh, expected value of this error component in our, our previous formula, then of course, if, if, uh, uh, if covariance of X and Epsilon is equal to zero by assumption, then, uh, then uh, this is enough to ensure that our ordinary least squares estimator uh, is unbiased. So therefore, we have, we have shown that uh, the that, uh, ordinary least squares estimator for the slope is uh, unbiased whenever this, uh, this uh, SLR4 assumption of zero conditional mean applies. And uh, notice that this is the only assumption we actually needed to use for this purpose. So, so there were also other assumptions on the list uh, of, this, of this voltage, but actually this was the only assumption that we actually needed to prove uh, unbiasedness of the ordinary least squares estimator. I still take a one, one step back and I want to clarify that the uh, that, uh, only thing that we require from the zero conditional mean is this part that covariance of X and Epsilon is equal to zero. So this is enough to show unbiasedness of the slope coefficient. We don't even need this assumption that the, that the expected value of Epsilon is e equal to zero. Uh, that part we actually need only for the uh, unbiasedness of the intercept term. So for, for the B1, B1 would be consistent estimate of B beta one if, uh, if this uh, expected value of epsilon is equal to zero. So that part, so a e expected value of epsilon equal to zero, we only need for unbiasedness of the intercept term. And the second part, the covariance of x and epsilon is equal to zero, that we need for the unbiasedness of the slope, co slope coefficient, B2. So this is also why I think it's important to clarify that which assumptions are needed for which particular property to understand that, okay, if the, if the assumption fails, then which properties are actually violated then. So we come back to the, to the endogeneity com condition then later in this course, because uh, it, it turns out that in many settings in uh, economic applications, this uh, uh, assumption of uh, zero conditional mean or that, uh, that uh, the explanatory variable is uncorrelated with the ep epsilon uh, might be violated. So, so in many co contexts, then, then uh, we are worried about this endogeneity bias. And we will, we will then discuss this in more detail later on. But at this stage, it's good to, good to understand that uh, if there is an uh, endogeneity problem, if this assumption of zero conditional mean is violated, then uh, we have a biased estimate. Now let's consider the second desirable property, which is called efficiency. And uh, efficiency is typically something very specifically used in the context of uh, ordinary least squares estimator. I'll explain you shortly why that's that the case. So here's the definition of efficiency in this context that, uh, that uh, we say that ordinary least squares estimator uh, is efficient if it has smaller variance than any other linear unbiased estimator. And again, I focus on the single regression case and I focus on the slope coefficient B2. So of course there are many other notions of efficiency in economics and, uh, and social sciences, but, uh, but in this specific context of regression, efficiency is, uh, is measured based on the variance of the estimator. And notice that uh, there's also this precondition that we do not compare to just any estimator it needs to be a linear estimator and it needs to be unbiased estimator. Okay, so within the group of unbiased estimators, uh, we want to have the uh, estimator that has smaller variance than some other competing estimators. So here is a similar uh, illustration of efficiency. So recall that for the, for the unbiasedness, we required that the expected value was equal to this true uh, true parameter beta 2. So here is an illustration from uh, Doherty's econometrics textbook. So now we are actually assuming that our estimators are un both are unbiased. So we compare two estimators A and B and both are bo both are unbiased estimators. And the question is, so should we use A or B? Then, uh, then here in this diagram, we have the density functions of two both estimators. And we see that uh, 
the variance of the estimator B is smaller. This is because this density function is more, more concentrated around its, its mean value, whereas estimator A has larger variance. So neither A nor B is systematically overestimating or underestimating. That's good, but, uh, but, uh, but typically then estimates produced by estimator B would be closer to this, uh, this uh, expected value, which is the true value of, that we are interested in estimating. So in that sense, we could think about this uh, estimator B as being, being more, more precise or more accurate. There is always some deviations, but typically the deviations from the, from the true parameter of interest that we are interested in estimating, they, the deviations are smaller for estimator B. This is kind of justifying the, the, the use of variance as a, as a criterion for efficiency. So what can we say about the efficiency of the ordinary least squares estimator then? So similar to this examination of uh, uh, unbiasedness, we can, we can still utilize the same formula that we developed previously. So recall that the B2 was equal to beta2 plus an error component. But now to examine efficiency, then we do not use expected value, but rather we examine variance. And now we then need to need to use this uh, rules of variance. So remember that uh, if we have variance of the sum of two components, so then we can evaluate the variance as the sum of the uh, evaluate variance of these two components separately, and then add add up those variances. So that's what I have done on the first uh, first line of the equation. And then another point is that recall that this uh, beta two is just a constant. And by the rules of the variance operator, we also know that variance of a constant is zero. So there's no, there's no variation whatsoever in this, in this true constant beta two. So what we only need is to examine the variance of this error component. Okay. So now we need to also introduce some additional assumptions and particularly to be able to, to, uh, rewrite this uh, variance of B2 uh, in a more compact form, we need to introduce this assumption that there's no autocorrelation. And this, this assumption is stating that, uh, that uh, for any pair of observations i and j, this, these error terms epsilon i and epsilon j are uncorrelated, or in other words, the covariance of epsilon i and epsilon j is equal to zero. So this allows us to get uh, rid of some covariance terms that would emerge when we start to rewrite this uh, variance of the error component. Uh, and, uh, and then we can, then we can uh, write it in a, in a more, more compact form. So this no autocorrelation assumption is uh, important for the efficiency uh, property of the ordinary least squares error, ordinary least squares estimator. And uh, again, we will also consider autocorrelation in more detail later in this, in this course. So this development of the of the variance expression is uh, is not so critically important to 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 know. I just wanted to illustrate that why this covariance matters because if we if we write this variance of this error component, then obviously this covariance also also plays a role here. Okay. So then there's another another property that we need to introduce, and that's called uh, homoscedasticity. This is also one of the assumptions of the of the Woolrich textbook, and basically in any any uh, econometrics textbook. So this homoscedasticity assumption is stating that the, the variance of the disturbance term epsilon is constant across all observations. So so uh, this variance of of epsilon for any given level of x is equal to some sigma squared. So sigma squared is some constant, and it's it should be finite as well. The main point is that this uh, this uh, variance of epsilon doesn't differ from one observation to another. Or, for example, for uh, if you are studying some companies, for example, the variance shouldn't be uh, large for the large companies and small for the small companies. It's constant, whatever the size of the companies or whatever the, the size of the households or countries or whatever we are analyzing. So, if that is the case, then it turns out that we can we can actually uh, formulate this variance of, of B2 as, uh, as uh, sigma squared divided by 
uh, n minus 1 times the sample variance of x. Okay, so then, then we have a quite a more, much more compact and intuitive formulation of this variance of B2 if uh, these two assumptions of homoscedasticity and no autocorrelation hold. And in fact, under these two assumptions, uh, it's possible to show that this ordered least squares estimate uh, B2 has smaller variance than any other linear unbiased uh, estimator. So this is uh, the very famous famous result going, going back to this uh, Carl Friedrich Krauss and, and then Markov has, uh, has uh, further, further improved this uh, mathematical proof. Uh, so essentially this, this result says that ordinary least squares estimator is efficient. And uh, this, this result is uh, to a large extent responsible for the, for the um, great popularity of the OLS estimator because it shows that uh, if we want to estimate the linear regression, then it's not possible to find any, any better estimator than, than OLS. It's not impossible to develop any, any, anything better than that uh, if we want to have both unbiased estimator, so there's no systematic bias, and we want to have the minimum variance. This is also the reason that why some texts then refer to OLS as the best linear unbiased estimator, or blue. This is this kind of term that you might also, this, this blue estimator, uh, sometimes, sometimes encounter if you, if you read the uh, theory of linear regression. And uh, I want to also highlight here that uh, in addition to this uh, exogeneity condition or zero conditional mean, this assumption also, uh, this property requires this homoscedasticity and no autocorrelation. Um, so if you're interested in the proof of the Gauss-Markov theorem, it may be interesting to, interesting to go through it. Um, you can find, for example, a Wikipedia article about Gauss-Markov theorem but uh, it, it falls beyond the scope of the, the present course. So, so I do not want to formally, uh, formally go through this kind of, kind of theoretical proof, but uh, it's good to know this term, Gauss-Markov theorem, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, what, what is the meaning? So in some sense, uh, for, for theoretical econometricians, uh, uh, it might seem a bad news because uh, this result states that, that that it's impossible to do anything better than this classic ordinary least squares. Uh, um, so 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 the classic OLS estimator is better than any anything even thinkable. It's not that that, that uh, by doing more research you could find something better. We already know in theory that if this is what we are interested in, unbiasedness and efficiency, then it's impossible to do anything better. So. Therefore, we need to either find some violations of those assumptions. So, for example, if we have an endogenous uh, endogeneity problem, or if we have a heteroscedasticity, or we have autocorrelation, then if any of these three assumptions is violated, then it's still possible to uh, find a find a better estimator. Another possibility then to 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 improve upon OLS is to then consider some other criteria, and I briefly also introduced to this third third property which is uh, called mean squared error and i believe this is also useful to know because uh, this is very often used as a criterion for example when when uh, people examine or compare performances of alternative estimators in terms of uh, computer simulations for example so-called monte carlo simulations and this is also very, very important criterion also in, uh, in non-parametric estimation. So mean squared error is defined literally as the expected value of the squared deviation. And if you, if you are interested in this uh, slope coefficient of the single regression case, so, so uh, beta 2 is this uh, true coefficient that we are interested in estimator, estimating, b2 is our estimator. So mean squared error is then, then just the uh, expected value of the squared difference between the estimator and the true parameter of interest. And uh, interestingly, actually, 
we can also break down this mean squared error um, in two parts. And I here I don't here prove this result completely, but I just give you a hint at how does it uh, how does it go to. So in fact, it turns out that uh, mean squared error is actually a sum of the variance of the estimator plus uh, bias squared, so bias to power two. So in that sense, the mean squared error combines this uh, uh, conveniently this uh, this um, bias and and variance parts of this classical unbiasedness and uh, efficiency arguments. And uh, now I want to want to still clarify that uh, that uh, it might appear that uh, ordinary least squares estimator is also most efficient in terms of mean squared error. But uh, because it is unbiased, so bias of the OLS estimator is zero, and it has the smallest variance among the unbiased estimators. However, it's possible to also also accept some some bias if it can, comes at the cost uh, if if it helps to improve uh, the variance. So, I mean, if if you accept small bias, but you can get a great benefit in terms of smaller variance, then it is possible to have a have a better estimator in terms of mean squared error. And here is the one more diagram that to, to, to illustrate this. So, on this diagram, uh, we compare three different uh, density functions. So, so, we have blue, red, and purple density functions. And these refer to the uh, three alternative estimators. And uh, here, Notice that this that this purple estimator, uh, this is clearly biased. But uh, so so here the expected value of the so the true value is supposed to be five, but the expected value of the purple estimator is five point two. So this purple estimator would systematically overestimate the quantity of interest. However, compared to the blue estimator, it has much smaller bias. So. So, uh, so has much smaller variance. So blue and red are also supposed to be uh, alternative estimators, but they are supposed to be unbiased in this case. So in some cases, it might be might be that uh, that you you are willing to expect some some systematic bias if your variance is uh, is smaller. So if you, it might be questionable, is it, is the red estimator or purple estimator better? But uh, if you compare blue estimator or purple estimator. So blue estimator is uh, is unbiased, but uh, unbiasedness also doesn't mean that the, the the density function is symmetric. So it's possible also that there is a, a large proportion of your estimates are anyway underestimating. And another thing is that uh, that uh, if if the variance of the estimator is very large, so it can be in practice it might be completely useless because if it has uh, has if it has very large variance. So in some cases, you might might want to ex accept some bias in exchange for much smaller variance. So this is what this bias variance trade off is is all about. That uh, that uh, sometimes it might be better to have a little bit more biased estimator, but if it if it helps to decrease the variance. So that completes my my discussion of the of the finite sample properties. Uh, I still want to remind you that uh, all these un un all these um, finite sample properties, unbiasedness, efficiency, and mean squared error, they apply irrespective of the sample size. So in the next lesson, I will then consider asymptotic properties, which uh, which consider particularly the case where the sample size approaches to infinity.